Uh, dear student, Assalamu alaikum. I welcome you to my video lecture number three. I'm your course instructor, Dr. Mazullah Khan, and today I will cover parts of chapter number one, which is Foundations of uh, Engineering Economy. Before proceeding to the main parts of chapter number one, uh, let's start with basic economics okay so why is economics important okay so economics is actually everywhere okay so we are making decisions on daily basis uh, and we use economics so suppose if you're a student let, let me write it down for you okay so you're a student okay and at the end of your undergraduate studies, uh, you have, let's say, two different options. Okay? Either you go for higher education, or you go to job market. Okay? Uh, some students will, of course, go for higher education, uh, assume, let's say, PhD, and some students will join uh, job market none of the students, none of the approach is actually wrong. There is nobody right, there is nobody wrong. Okay, so people make decisions based on their own uh, preferences. Okay, some students will think that it will pay them uh, better in a way if they go for a higher education and some students think that probably job market is the best way to go because it will get them some experience and with the passage of time, their market value will actually keep on uh, going higher and higher. So economics is everywhere, okay? The main thing, which at the end of the day, you have to decide whether your economics, we call it returns on education. Okay, so students who are going, let's say, for higher education, the first question that they need to ask whether returns on education is greater than their investment. If it's higher, then of course it makes some sense. Uh, on the other hand, what the job market seekers, uh, what they need to ask is whether uh, their benefit of joining the market is actually uh, greater than for not going, let's say, for higher education. So everybody makes decisions in a way which maximizes their own uh, benefits. So economics, the whole point is everywhere. Uh, suppose if you're talking about corporations, okay? And consider, let's say, Apple. Uh, you might have heard that Apple is actually outsourcing its uh, uh, screen and uh, Samsung is actually preparing screens for their iPhones and recently they have uh, started outsourcing to LG as well. So the management of Apple when they face a situation where they need to decide whether they make uh, screens for their own iPhones or whether they outsource it, they are using basic economics uh, analytical tools. Okay, so let's say if it makes more sense to outsource it, they will outsource it. And since they have outsourced it, I would assume that economically, economics-wise, it makes actually more sense if they outsource it to, uh, to uh, Samsung or LG. Okay, and suppose let's say governments. Different governments uh, around the world, they are making decisions uh, on daily basis. Uh, policy makers, suppose, um, they have to decide whether they spend money, let's say, more in education or, let's say, infrastructure. Or, let's say, something else. Okay, let's say health. Okay, the main purpose of any government is actually to maximize social returns. 
So they would like to spend their money in a way which actually maximizes social returns for their citizens. Okay, so let's say one government, they may think that, okay, investing in education is a good idea. Other governments, they may think that it's time to actually invest in, infra in, in infrastructure because it provides impetus to the economic growth. So it really depends on the governments and the way they see uh, uh, the social return for their uh, citizens. The whole purpose of this discussion is that let's say if a student is going for higher education or let's say if he or she is going for job market, uh, for corporations, let's say if they outsource or if they do not outsource, there is no wrong decision and there is no right decision. Okay. What rational choices theory says that people are making rational choices in a way which maximizes the benefits for themselves. So since all individuals are different, so my benefits associated with education may be different uh, compared to somebody else. Okay, so let's say if I'm making a decision for myself, I'm making a rational choice. Okay, so at all, at any point in time, actually, I have a number of choices uh, to choose from. I make those choices which actually maximizes my benefit. Okay, but not everybody is making actual rational choices. There is a very famous uh, professor in development economics from uh, Harvard and uh, he also teaches actually in University of Chicago. His name is Professor Sandil Molanathan. Now Professor Sandil Molanathan, he says that solving social problems is not that easy and he actually compares it with a 1000 kilometers race he says that 999 kilometers sometimes is easy uh, but uh, for, for nations of course not for individuals but the last kilometer or the last mile is actually the most difficult uh, one to achieve the reason is in 1960, apologies, in 1960, the mortality rate in India uh, for children, actually, uh, whenever they are suffering from diarrhea, was 24%. So unfortunately, one quarter of uh, children, uh, they, they, they lost their lives to diarrhea. Over the period of time, the, the easiest actually medication uh, treatment for diarrhea is actually more fluids. Okay, uh, but when actually they conducted a survey in India, most of the parents, uh, in fact, the survey suggested that 35 to 60 percent parents, they thought that whenever their kids are facing diarrhea, they stop actually fluid. And the scientists, the researchers were actually, um, they, they were actually perplexed that why is it happening? Because in this condition, normally kids need more fluid. So with passage of time, uh, what happened actually after 30 or 40 years, this mortality rate dropped to actually 6%. So a huge improvement. Now, Professor Sandil Mulanathan, what he thinks that going from 24 to 6% was easiest because you educate parents, uh, you provide them with, let's say, basic resources. Uh, but the last 6% of the parents actually, they have their own mental models of, let's say, taking a certain situation. Okay. And they were not able to actually process the information correctly and they were still not giving, let's say, enough fluid to their children. What Professor Mulanathan said that 
some of the parents actually I have wrote it here they said that why put water in a leaking uh, bucket so let's say if you give fluid to children in a diarrhea normally those fluids uh, are not absorbed by the body and they are let's say um, uh, the kids actually uh, lose their fluid actually through through diarrhea so the parents thought that there is no point of uh, giving more water uh, or putting more water actually in a leaky bucket so the whole point of this discussion is that although people are making rational choices but sometimes some people are actually uh, they have a limited capacity to make uh, rational choices put it that way scientists call it bounded rationality okay so yes most of the people they make rational choices but for some actually it's bounded okay so there is a rubber, uh, bound for rationality now there is a term aid value okay so whenever you are choosing like for example let's say uh, for corporations if Apple is choosing between outsourcing versus no outsourcing in-house okay I apologize so how are these decisions made so that choice will be actually chosen which adds more value to the company now this is a very very technical concept adding value what it really means in simplest uh, words so suppose if you would like to start a business so you would like to start business with your partner with your let's say two partners so three partners in total okay and the business actually the startup will cost let's say 10 million rupees okay so each partner contributes 3 million so in total sorry uh, each partner contributes 1 million so the total contribution by partners is rupees 3 million and the remaining 7 million is raised let's say from capital market to either bond issue or let's say um, for example let's say if if you borrow from the bank okay so this is technically called equity and this is called debt okay so if a bank is providing you debt of course they are expecting a return on their loan okay and let's say if somebody is buying your shares on Karachi Stock Exchange okay so instead of let's say these three partners you have let's say uh, 3,000 shareholders okay so equity holders shareholders are exactly the same thing so equity holders are also expecting a minimum return so suppose if I have some savings and tomorrow if I would like to invest it in equity market what I do I actually buy let's say shares of PTCL for example okay so whenever I buy shares okay I'm expecting return and that return is either in the form of dividend or market appreciation of the share okay so suppose assume that this business actually uh, sorry uh, the required the minimum required rate of return again this is a technical term uh, so do not worry about this one we will uh, cover this in uh, our coming chapters suppose the minimum required rate of return for equity holders is 10 percent and for debt holders it's let's say uh, six percent and again this is something technical most of the time I would say 99.9% .9 of the time the cost of debt will be less cost of debt will be less than cost of equity 
Okay, there is a reason for it. I would not uh, go into detail, uh, but uh, trust me, most of the time it will be less than. Uh, I mean, the cost of debt will be less than the cost of equity. So here, as you can see, 30% of financing is coming from equity and 70% financing is coming from debt. So WEC, which is a weighted average cost of capital in this situation is 30% of 10% plus 70% of uh, 7 sorry, 30% uh, of 3 million, apologies, no, we, we have to talk about uh, in terms of return, so 30% of 10% return plus 70% uh, of 6% return, okay, so this one is 3, plus 4.2 so the weighted average cost of capital if I did my calculations right should be 7.2 percent okay so whenever a company is operating profitably uh, it is most likely to add value it will only add value let's say if the re the return on the return of uh, that company is more than 7.2 percent okay so suppose a company is profitable and they are making uh, what they call a return on total investment is let's say 12 percent is 12 percent okay so the weighted average cost of capital so this is a single number which satisfies the expectation of equity holders and debt holders. Again, this is something important. So 7.2% was calculated based on this, 10% and 6% and it was actually weighted. So what it technically means that 7.2 is a single number which satisfies the expectation of equity holders and shareholders okay so suppose the return of, on the investment of a company is 12 percent it means that 7.2 percent will be paid out to equity holders and debt holders and the remaining 4.8 percent so remaining 4.8 percent is added to the company And that is the added value. Okay, although it's it is it is a little bit technical, but it's it's not that technical. Uh, all businesses they carry a certain portion as an equity and a certain portion as debt. Okay, and whenever we calculate WAC, which is the weighted average cost of capital, okay, so if the return on investment is more than the weighted average cost of capital that company is actually adding value uh, if it's uh, not uh, let's say if it is making uh, the return on investment is less than let's say 7.2 uh, percent then it is not adding any value in fact the company is actually shrinking now what is economics so economics it's a social science that studies how individuals, firms, governments, and nations make choices while allocating limited resources to satisfy their unlimited wants and wishes. Okay, so economics is all about making choices. But of course, we do not have unlimited resources. Okay everybody has a certain budget in literature we call it budget constraint okay so even if you are let's say the richest person uh, like uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon I was reading this morning uh, this gentleman has hundred and nineteen billion dollars uh, worth okay so even if you are Jeff Bezos okay 
you have a budget uh, you have a limit on your on your budget so you have a budget constraint you cannot spend more than 119 billion dollars of course if somebody gives you money as a loan you can spend more money but this is not unlimited it's it's a limited budget wants and wishes on the other hand it's unlimited it's unlimited okay so for example let's say if if you are shopping for a computer okay you want probably the fastest uh, processor um, maybe SSD um, maybe I would say let's say um, minimum of let's say 32 GB of RAM uh, and the, 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 the wish list is just like a laundry list it's it's never ending but unfortunately your choices are limited by your available budget okay so yes of course we are free to make choices as long as we are within our budget limits okay so the most important parts of this definition is of course choices and then allocating of uh, allocation of resources and then we have to uh, actually it has to be within a certain budget so whenever I, I see any definition what I do I actually underline all the keywords so the keywords in this definition is choices limited resources and then unlimited wants now there is another definition okay these definitions are pretty similar very similar uh, but actually they are describing the same phenomena in a different way so economics is a science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses okay so again your means are limited okay and one standard thing between one of the standard not one but one of the standard uh, things between those uh, two definitions is alternative alternative uses okay uh, most of the times we have choices and then we have a choice set and then we pick the best choice okay which in a way maximizes uh, our benefits uh, or where we optimize actually so example let's say Suzuki okay so every idea every business idea starts with a problem okay so what does let's say Suzuki vehicle does they solve a problem of transportation okay so there is a customer perspective and there is a manufacturer's perspective customers perspective uh, they actually as I said their wish list is unlimited okay so what do they need for example they need hi-fi technology for example they need uh, let's say cruise control and let's say that one is the adaptive one adaptive cruise control okay uh, they also let's say need lane keep assist okay let's say the customer also needs for example uh, uh, what else can be let's say collision mitigation system so Honda has actually this technology and many other manufacturers as well uh, so let's say if the car is about to collide with anything it applies automatic brakes okay uh, for example let's say ABS or this is a very old technology by the way uh, but let's say so the list is actually the wish list is unlimited as I said it's just like a laundry list but the resources customer says I cannot spend more than 800k now that's the problem 
okay so now customer's decision is mainly based on his or her budget which is eight hundred thousand dollars how what is the best way actually to spend this money that is economics okay so he or she will choose uh, the best alternative based on uh, her, his or her budget now manufacturers perspective of course let's say if you're working for uh, for Suzuki or any other manufacturer uh, you would li like to design let's say state-of-the-art uh, vehicle just like the other day I showed you a video of uh, press a bottle but there was another video actually for uh, for the submarine now those individuals come up with something very very sophisticated uh, so as an engineer you may come up with let's say uh, a vehicle which actually checks all these boxes okay but what let's say what if a situation where you are designing a product which is supposed to compete let's say with Suzuki Meharam and let's say you are working for Toyota your Toyota employee let's say okay so you are thinking to put everything possible in the vehicle but actually your target market are those individuals who could only afford let's say eight hundred thousand dollars uh, eight hundred thousand uh, rupees car okay so Suzuki Mehran segment now of course your cho choices are also limited by by the fact uh, that uh, you may not be able to actually compete in the market let's say if you put each and everything possible in the vehicle okay so your ability to design or, or let's say create a vehicle is limited by some market forces okay competition so if you are competing with Suzuki Mehran you have to uh, of course uh, respect the budget so the cost of production should be of course less than 800,000 uh, rupees so if you are making if you if your cost of production is let's say 1 million rupees per car of course you cannot uh, compete with 800,000 price point so even from the customers perspective there is economics involved in their decision making from manufacturer's perspective, again, there is economics involved in this, I, I mean, in their decision-making uh, process. So why is economics important? I started with students, then I moved to corporation, then I moved to actually governments. Individuals, households, managers, workers, organizations, nations, okay, they all take economic decisions with limited, of course, resources, their wants or ends or let's say needs, they are unlimited and there is alternative actually uses of uh, these resources. So if you're, let's say, if you're a policy maker, uh, if you're, let's say, conceiving a project, of course, you could spend that money on something else. So as a policy maker uh, or as an engineer for that matter, uh, your job is actually to evaluate all the alternatives and then come up with a profitable uh, project, which adds uh, more value to your company. So these three are the key ingredients of any decisions, okay, any economic decisions. You have limited resources to satisfy unlimited wants, okay, and you make choices after considering all the alternative uses of those resources, okay. So economics is a science that helps to make best use of limited resources by making best choices that satisfy unlimited needs okay so if i would like if you would like to use these three key terms 
okay this is the way you use it okay so economics is all about using limited resources to set aside unlimited wants after considering all the alternatives now why is economics important for you as engineers for a very very simple reason economics actually provides you very very powerful analytical tools uh, and as I, sh I, I told you in my second lecture you may come up with a very very ingenious idea but if it does not make any economic sense your boss or even you as an entrepreneur wouldn't entertain that idea okay so all the engineers they design and they create but these decisions actually involve some resources okay so designing involves economic decisions engineers must be able to incorporate those economic analysis into their creative efforts if they do not they will end up just like the other two guys who uh, developed let's say uh, submarines so submarines for uh, individuals they thought that that idea may have uh, some traction for for tourism sector and of course some uh, defense purposes as well often engineers must select and implement from multiple alternatives so that is extremely extremely important you do not pick any idea and just start working with it okay you pick an idea and then you consider multiple alternatives so there is a decision making process i'll show you in the coming slides uh, that every engineer has to follow okay uh, it it it's like a science okay it's not about liking or disliking something uh, but it's it's a science even if you like something uh, but let's say if it doesn't make any sense economic sense uh, then it's not worth taking that uh, risk understanding the use of engineering economics techniques like for example time value of money uh, economic equivalence and cost estimation are vital for engineers okay so these are some basic tools i wouldn't say that these are like very sophisticated tools these are very basic tools but as an engineer you should be able to use those uh, tools and by the way these tools are not only important for your profession but they are also important let's say for your for your some uh, let's say personal decisions uh, for example, let's say, just to give you an example, just I just thought of it. So suppose uh, you're considering to buy, let's say, uh, a furnace, okay? So in countries which are cold, uh, they have actually, all houses actually a furnace okay so you may buy let's say a sixteen hundred dollars furnace which is less energy efficient and you may buy actually a thirty five hundred dollars furnace which is more and i'm talking about comparatively okay so it is comparatively more energy efficient Okay, so you should be able once you ha once you have once you master those uh, techniques, you should be able to decide whether a thirty five hundred dollars furnace is worth the investment. And of course, you can easily do that once you know those uh, techniques. Okay, so once you uh, know the savings, the energy savings, then of course you can use some tools and then you can decide uh, whether in long term this option a is better or option b is better another example would be let's say if you are considering to buy a car okay so do you want to buy a normal combustion engine or let's say hybrid so hybrid and combustion engine okay so normal petrol engine okay uh, of course you could you can you can apply some analytical tools and you can come to the conclusion whether for your situation and of course as i said everybody's different so some people may think 
that a normal combustion engine is better in their situation. Assuming, let's say, if everybody is indifferent about the environment, okay, and let's say if they are making decision based only on the dollars term, okay, so based on money only, okay. So one, let's say, one individual may think that normally I drive my car only for five years, and combustion engine vehicles are normally, let's say, I'm thinking about dollars. So normally these cars, so a mid-size not a mid-size but small size let's say Honda Civic will cost you $25,000 okay a comparable hybrid will cost you close to $35,000 okay so $10,000 more okay uh, but of course this one saves you fuel okay so one individual thinks that he or she will drive this car only for five years okay so he or she may go actually for combustion engine okay but let's say if that individual thinks that, okay, I will drive this car for the next, let's say 15 years, I will drive it to the ground, okay, then probably it would be worth to pay $10,000 more and go for hybrid because it may save him or her more actually uh, money in terms of fuel saving, okay. So as I said, yes, these are important tools, okay. For your job but these tools are also important let's say for your own uh, personal uh, decisions okay which affects you a proper economic analysis for selection and execution is fundamental task of uh, engineering this is very obvious now the accreditation board for engineers and technology the way they define Engineering is engineering is a profession in which knowledge of mathematical and natural sciences is gained by the study. Expertise and practice is applied with judgment. So this is important judgment to develop ways to utilize economically the material and forces of the nature for the benefit of mankind. Okay. So even the way this body defines engineering. So engineers should apply their knowledge, uh, whatever they gain through, let's say, study, experience, uh, and practice, to develop ways to utilize economically the material. Okay. So again, uh, if you are working for a company or let's say if you are an inter entrepreneur, your resources will always be limited. Okay. And your job is to uh, utilize those resources in the best possible manner. Okay, so it's a very, very important, uh, important element of uh, this definition, this economically. A successful engineering decision is one which is sound from a technical perspective, okay, but of course it should be also sound from economic perspective. An economic solution is one that makes efficient use of resources. So the whole point again to summarize it for you even if you are an engineer uh, you have to uh, make decisions which ensures efficient utilization of resources now engineering economics involves formulating estimating and evaluating expected economic outcomes of alternatives designed to accomplish a defined objective okay and this thing will be more clear when I uh, cover um, uh, some material in the coming slides so engineering economics is all about formulating and then what you do you estimate okay you estimate let's say cash flows uh, with all the alternatives and then you evaluate all the alternatives okay and once you do the evaluation your economic outcomes will be of course expected okay because these are what we call the evaluation is done on forecasted cash flows so these are not actually these are not actual these are not actual cash flows okay because we are doing 
analysis or we are evaluating projects for forecasted cash flows okay something which will happen in future okay so it has a degree of probability that's why at the end of each project what they do uh, they analyze those, those projects and um, let's say they, they, they some, somehow are looking for variances that okay where are these variances uh, coming from okay a good project uh, would be one which let's say minimize the variance okay uh, so suppose one project thinks that okay um, let's say labor cost will be 100,000 K okay but the actual was let's say 105 another project says okay the labor cost this one is projected or the forecasted okay to the hundred thousand projected is let's say 100k but actual was let's say 110 okay so of course this project was conceived I mean was planned uh, uh, more properly compared to this one because here the variance is low okay this only uh, $5,000 uh, more spent on projected uh, actually lower cost so that's why it's expected economic outcomes these are not the actual outcomes okay and while doing so we start actually with a certain objective so we have a definite a defined sorry a defined objective in mind now this one is a typical seven step uh, process in engineering economy uh, economy study okay I actually trimmed it for you so it's more visible so it's exactly the same thing everything starts with a problem everything starts with a problem uh, so suppose let's say transportation okay uh, suppose it is, is an individual my problem is actually transportation okay or let's say on a, on a, on a, my, a macro scale let's say government of Pakistan they are thinking to link different cities let's say with Gawadar Gawadar port okay so Gawadar port okay so again transportation of goods is the problem okay uh, and how to give you more detail uh, the government would like to link let's say Gawadar port to different uh, cities okay so that's uh, the problem as an engineer your job is actually to gather data as well okay so it's actually not the job of your boss to give you data as well okay so your boss will actually give you a broader problem okay it's your job to gather data okay and look for alternative solutions so for example considering this problem okay one of the solution is let's say a road network road network okay the other one is let's say rail rail track or railway track okay uh, another extreme let's say alternative although these three are not very comparable but because these one are ground and the other one is let's say air okay so these are the three possible ways where I can address my problem okay my next job your next job uh, as an engineer is actually to forecast cash flows okay and other estimates now of course while estimating the cash flows the first thing to start with is the expected life of the project okay revenues associated with that project and of course there will be some cost taxes and project financing okay as I said the resources are limited so let's say if the government has only let's say uh, 100 billion rupees for let's say development of this project okay and suppose the project turns out to be let's say 120 billion okay so the government can always borrow money okay from banks or let's say some other sources by floating bonds or something else okay so your job as an engineer is of course gather the data and then 
uh, estimate cash flows for each uh, for each uh, alternative. Okay, so you will do the same exercise for let's say a road network, for a railway track, and then let's say for uh, airway traffic. Now, once I do, once you do that, of course you have to use a yardstick to measure which alternative is better. There are some tools like, for example, present work, rate of return, benefit cost analysis, and there are some other tools as well. Okay, uh, but please keep in mind that while evaluating different options, different alternatives, you have to use the same yard yardstick. Okay, and only then uh, um, your analysis is comparable. Okay. Now, engineering economic analysis, you also do some non-economic factors, some sensitivity analysis, risk analysis. We will cover these in, uh, in, uh, in, in this book. Sometimes, and I'm talking actually about developed countries, some projects, even though they are a better option, suppose, on a certain yardstick, for example, let's say present work, but even then they are rejected because their environmental uh, carbon footprint is way too high okay and the government thinks no although it's it is saving us some money but no we will not uh, go for it um, one example that i can think of is clean energy so for example some countries have stopped uh, producing electricity with uh, coal okay because it's 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 not good for the environment so all the other options, they're more expensive, uh, but the governments are uh, going for those options because uh, they think that uh, we have to be environmentally responsible. Once we do the non once we include the non-economic factors in our analysis as well, uh, we choose best alternative, okay? And we choose best alternative, of course, based on the yardstick that we choose at step number four and based on the non-economic factors in step number five. And once we arrive at a best alternative, of course, then there is a stage for implementation and monitoring, okay? And for implementation, mostly what they do, they hire actually project managers, okay? Again, they are engineers. Uh, but they also specialize in project management. This step is will not most likely be done by uh, the same person. So starting from one to six, it will be done one by one person. The implementation and monitoring will be some uh, will be done by uh, somebody else. Most of the time, it's actually the consultant uh, who does this work. Okay. Uh, once the whole project cycle actually completes, of course, the company is free to go and, let's say, uh, execute another project. So they start with step number one again. So this is a very, very uh, systematic seven-step uh, process. Okay. You start with the problem. Uh, you gather data. You estimate cash flows for all um, the alternatives. Uh, you use the same yardstick and measure the worth of each alternative. Uh, you consider some non-economic factors, you choose best alternative, and then the implementation and monitoring uh, stage uh, kicks in. Now, as an engineer, you have to follow a code of ethics. Okay, so whenever we talk about code, Normally, this one is interchangeably used with morals. Okay, uh, but let's say there are what they call universal or common morals. Okay, for example, everybody thinks, everybody believes that, uh, let's say, telling lie is bad. Okay, uh, stealing is bad. Okay, um, violence is bad. Okay, uh, some of them are personal or 
individual models. Okay, so for example, let's say, um, for example, let's say if somebody in your neighborhood, let's say if they are uh, stealing electricity, let's say, okay, so I'm not sure if it is your legal obligation to report those individuals to, to the authorities, uh, but some people think that since uh, the culprits are uh, actually, their actions are uh, damaging other uh, neighbors as well, uh, so it is our moral responsibility to actually report those uh, individuals. So this is something actually personal or individual morals. But whenever it comes to different professional bodies or different professions, like for example, engineering, medicine, or let's say there is code of uh, conduct, let's say a code of ethics for uh, uh, what's it called, uh, risk management professionals and some other professions, of course, uh, they are referred to as codes. Okay, not models, but code. Okay, so code of ethics. So all disciplines have a formal code of ethics. Okay, for engineering in the US, it's actually the National Society of Professional Engineers who maintains codes. Okay, so codes is like a set of standards. Okay, that you as a professional has to follow. Many engineering professional societies have their own uh, code. And this is like an example, okay? And the uh, National Society of Professional Engineers, uh, their code is actually uh, uh, is included in the book actually in Appendix uh, C. So whenever you get a chance, please read that uh, as well. Although it's not necessary, so. Some professions are regulated. In some countries, like, and I can tell you about uh, USA and Canada, Engineering is a regulated profession. Medicine is a regulated profession. And the reason it is regulated because uh, your profession is related with safety of uh, individuals. Okay, so of course medicine, you can see the link, uh, but let's say if you're a civil engineer uh, and let's say if you're um, in any construction industry, like in any role, like architect, uh, of course, your professionalism, uh, your integrity actually uh, means a lot for the safety of the people. In these countries, you cannot practice without a license. Okay, so if you would like to work as a professional engineer in USA, you have to get a license. Okay, and you have to have license uh, you have to a member. You have to be a member of that body in good standing. Okay, so you have to get number one license, and number two, you have to be a member in good standing, which really means that even if you have a license, and let's say for some reasons, for some misconduct or anything, if your license is revoked or suspended, okay, you cannot practice. Okay, so you have to be a member in good standing. Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta in Canada. Uh, it's a licensing body. Okay, so if so, the whole purpose is to tell you that okay, there are some bodies which are working actually at a national level, like US and Canada, but there are some bodies which are working at the state level as well. So professional engineers, this is actually coming straight from the preamble of APEGA, okay? So professional engineers and geoscientists shall recognize that professional ethics is founded upon integrity, competence, dignity, and devotion to service. This concept shall guide their conduct all the time, okay? So there is a very good uh, case uh, study. Let me tell you the page number. It's uh, on page number nine. Okay, so let me write it down for you. Uh, example 1.2, page number nine. Okay, so it's it's like a case study uh, about uh, 
the Code of Ethics. Please read that and if you have any questions we can discuss it in my next lecture. So at the end let me uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions regarding this lecture you can reach me at my email address which is mazulla at gk.edu.pk or let's say if the question is administration related please direct that email to Ms. Sabahat at sabahat dot at sabahat at gk.edu.pk. I thank you again and have a wonderful day.